Street curbs continue, Minister. What's the sense you're getting on the ground about the, I guess, the cautious reopening of the country? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, in fact, uh, we are still in uh, uh, this uh, stabilization phase. But the fact that we are able to um, ho host this uh, Bloomberg uh, New Economy Forum in the midst of this stabilization phase is a very important marker. It reflects our ability to manage the situation and contain the infection while we continue with our lives and continue with economic activities and gradually open up. And uh, the forum is one of our pilots. And if it is successfully conducted, we are hoping that we will then be able to roll out more such events and uh, continue our journey towards uh, COVID resilience. One important factor to consider is the fact that we have actually ramped up our vaccination rate to above uh, more, more than the 85% for the whole population. So I think this is a key uh, uh, strategy. And we have also started to roll out uh, right. a booster program for the more vulnerable. This allows us to open up uh, uh, progressively and safely. Hey, you talk about stabilization. This stabilization phase is meant to run through November 21st. It's just days away. Given that there is a sense of stability and infection rates are pretty stable as well, uh, can we expect those uh, restrictions to be removed? We are looking at the situation very carefully. As you know, we are very cautious, particularly about our healthcare capacity. The situation has more or less stabilized, and we are hoping that we will be able to make some uh, review and see whether there's, there will be opportunity for us to make some adjustments. But over the next few days, it's very critical. You know, we will still have to continue to monitor because we have, we have just uh, opened up uh, uh, very recently uh, to, to allow uh, members of the same household to dine together. We will still need a few more days to observe the trends to make sure that the situation remains stable. And if so, I think we would have an opportunity to make adjustments to our safety measures here. As it stands now, though, Minister, do you expect the curbs, the virus curbs, to persist beyond November 21st? As it stands, as of today? As of today, it's very difficult to say because uh, it is still too early. Some of the effects of our recent opening, uh, allowing a, a same household to dine together, uh, still has not been fully seen. So it is important for us to watch very carefully over the next few days, and then uh, we will then take a quick review and decide whether or not uh, there will be adjustments uh, come uh, 21st uh, November. Singapore has been pushing ahead with the VTLs. The vaccinated travel lanes are more expected in the coming weeks or days. In fact, uh, this is part of the progress uh, towards uh, COVID resilience. As we uh, ramp up our vaccination, we will be able to open our border and uh, allow more people to come to Singapore and allow Singaporeans to go overseas. And the vaccinated travel lane is one key strategy to allow vaccinated uh, individuals to travel without the need for quarantine. And we have started it with uh, Germany and Brunei. Uh, I talked about it last time when I was on the show. And uh, we are beginning to roll out to a lot more countries, including Europe, um, uh, uh, US, as well as Australia. And progressively, we are planning to extend this uh, VTL to more countries as situation uh, improves. Would that include Asian countries like Japan, for instance? Can you name some of the countries uh, potentially uh, establishing that VTL? Um, we are looking at quite a number of countries, including our neighbours, uh, both uh, Malaysia and uh, Indonesia. And we are also, of course, uh, exploring the possibility uh, to have this VTL with even countries like uh, Korea and Japan. But it also depends uh, on the situation both in Singapore as well as the situation in the destination country, whether they are prepared and ready to open up uh, to Singapore and the region as well. When it comes to Malaysia, though, Minister, the question is really when you'll open up the land border control. Is there a sense when that might happen? Malaysia has suggested perhaps it could happen by the end of the month, but nothing yet from Singapore. We are uh, optimistic. I think uh, between Singapore and, uh, and Malaysia, the officials are working very hard to work out the details because, as you would appreciate, uh, the land link is uh, uh, more complicated than the air link because uh, there, there's, it's, it is a lot more porous and uh, therefore the immigration system has to be put in place. And uh, we have to also find a way to segregate those who are vaccinated versus those who are not because the vaccinated travel lane is meant for those who are vaccinated. So I think there is a lot of uh, logistic that needs to be managed on the ground and we are in close uh, discussion with uh, uh, our Malaysian counterparts and I'm uh, 
cautiously optimistic uh, that we will be able to do so uh, quite soon. Might it happen on November 29th? There is a possibility, and we are hoping that uh, we will be able to announce uh, our uh, launch date uh, uh, shortly. So be patient with us, and I know many Singaporeans uh, have, uh, uh, in Malaysia want them to come back, and uh, be patient with us. Uh, Minister, I want to touch on trade. Uh, we've been talking about bottlenecks, the supply chain disruptions. How long do you think that may last? I think it will take a while uh, because uh, not only um, there's uh, difficulties while, in uh, clearing Minister? the background. Uh, sorry? Can you quantify sense is, uh, a it will take how long do you see that happening? To persist through 2022, perhaps? Uh, perhaps uh, I think it will be it will take all the way to the second half of uh, 2022 before we are able to ensure that um, the uh, bottlenecks are clear because there's some backlog that we will need to clear. At the same time, we are seeing demand rising very rapidly. So I think uh, as we emerge from COVID-19, it will take time for the machinery to start uh, to move, and you need to put lubrication and making making sure that the gears are engaged. So it will take take a while for the whole machinery to re return to normalcy. Minister, one of the issues is chip manufacturing. We now have the U.S. demanding more data from countries on chip manufacturing. What's your sense? Uh, there's been a dismay among, uh, among the countries in the region. I think uh, we will need to continue to work with our uh, major economic partners, um, including uh, the U.S., to see how we can um, uh, smoothen the uh, supply line for including uh, our products, including uh, chips, which is very critical for the manufacturing uh, uh, process. Uh, but, and that also underscores the importance for us to ensure uh, su supply chain resilience. I talked about it uh, several times, and in addition to uh, onshoring some of these production rates, it's also important for us to ensure there's diversity in terms of our sources of supplies. And it is also uh, useful for us to go towards a digitalization of our trading arrangement so that many of these uh, data and information will then be able to be available much more uh, easily. Because with digital tran uh, transactions, uh, many of these will then uh, facilitate uh, the trade, uh, including uh, products as well as chips. Uh, Minister, the U.S. is pushing for a new economic framework beyond CPTPP. What do you make of that? Does it make sense? We, we had a, a very good uh, discussion with uh, Secretary Ramando when she was here uh, on this particular topic, and we wanted to explore the opportunities for U.S. to re-engage in uh, Asia-Pacific, and this will be an important platform uh, for that to happen. And Singapore is very happy to be able to be part of it, and uh, uh, it is still early days. Uh, many details need to be worked out, and uh, our people, our officials are working together with U.S. and a few uh, key partners to see how we can work on some of the frame, basic framework, then we will have uh, more details, more concrete ideas to be able to discuss with our uh, partners in this region. And, and uh, it, it, it has to be something that is inclusive and uh, flexible so that we are able to uh, have a more greater participation. And uh, it, it will be a quite an ambitious plan, but we may need to do so in a step-by-step -step approach so that we are able to uh, reach our destination eventually. So I think we are working uh, uh, with uh, uh, officials among our partner, uh, uh, of our, our like-minded partners to see how we can come up with some uh, basic framework so, so as to facilitate our discussion with uh, other interested parties. And Minister, on CPTPP, we know that both China and Taiwan uh, want to be members uh, of that grouping. Is it likely but that, that both uh, will be included in CPTPP? Or is there a risk that Taiwan may be hindered by China? Singapore uh, welcomes uh, any uh, economies who are interested in uh, participating in the CPTPP because it is important for CPTPP to be inclusive, as well as I mentioned earlier. And uh, uh, both uh, Taiwan and uh, uh, China have uh, indicated their interest. I think we will need to go through the accession process, discuss uh, with the uh, various uh, uh, members of the CPTPP. As you know, CPTPP works on consensus, and uh, we will have to then uh, make sure that uh, uh, 
consultation is done, and then we are, then we will be able to reach a consensus on the whether or not uh, to uh, accede to, uh, to the application. At the same time, uh, economists who are interested to apply must also ensure that they are able to meet the high standards of requirements of a CTPPP. And therefore, we would like to uh, encourage uh, those who are interested to uh, consult uh, uh, bilaterally as well, so that they are able to address the views and concerns and interests of the respective parties. And this way, then the process will then be able to be facilitated. Uh, Minister, as we emerge from this pandemic and try to address the issues of supply chain disruptions, uh, there is a risk that globalization may take a backseat and regionalization comes into effect, and that may mean higher costs for companies. Your take on that? I think this is a reality that we have to uh, face up with. But I think it's important for us to also remember that as we try to uh, regionalize or onshoring many of our activities in order to ensure that we are resilient. But at the same time, as you mentioned, I think costs may go up because it is uh, less than optimal. And therefore, I, there will be a point at, at which uh, companies and businesses will realize that it is not possible to onshore or regionalize, to regionalize everything. So it is still very important to ensure resilience in the global supply chain. So it is also important, therefore, to work with our key partners to see how we can further strengthen uh, supply chain resilience. And in this particular area, I think Singapore has a uh, important role to play, being a hub for business, for travel, for uh, logistics, for supply chains. I think Singapore will be able to be, uh, play a role as a key node in the global supply chain to ensure that uh, the various links are uh, connected to preserve the connectivity of this uh, region as well as the world. And that is also why even during the pandemic, we have ensured that our connections remain open, our ports remain operational, our air links remain connected. In this way, we will help to facilitate uh, supply chain resilience.